Welcome, Renee. Thank you. The good news is we're going to be out of church really early today. <laughs> So, 2020, some year, huh? Between COVID and politics, does thinking about this last year bring up some really strange feelings? Maybe a little overwhelmed, maybe a little out of control, maybe a little helpless at times, maybe a little unsettled. Did you ever think that this has just maybe been a test for all of us? You know, like the one that they do on TV that interrupts your favorite show just as they're about to tell who the real villain is. And we hear, me, me, me. This is a test. This is only a test. This is a test of God's emergency broadcast system. A test to see how well you get that whole be still, I've got this thing. You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. You know that thing from Proverbs 3. This has only been a test. If this had been an actual emergency, I would have directed you to another appropriate scripture. Or the Lord would have returned to get us and take us all out of this mess. Regular programming will now resume, but be on guard, there will be other tests. If you've struggled with this past year or so with it, all of its ups and downs and turnarounds, I'd like to share some lessons that I learned from my mama and Jesus about the importance of our continued connection to the Lord and what it takes to keep that connection. Bear with me, this is a little harder than I thought it was going to be talking about my mom. My mom wasn't perfect. She was a product of her generation. She had her faults and struggles like we all do, but she loved us. She was loyal and she was a prayer warrior, and she worked every day on her connection to the Lord. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to John 15, verses 1 through 11 with me? Or your phones. John 15, 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it will bear even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must be, remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that he bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Lord, we thank you for your word and the guidance that it provides. I ask now that you would reveal yourself to us through these words and through this message. Amen. Now, what I just read was from the NIV translation. In the King James Version, version the word abide is 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 used instead of remain, but both abide and remain mean the same, to stay, to connect with. So when things upend our life, how do we prepare ahead of, for the time, or how do we sustain that connection to God during times of turmoil? We start by making sure we're making good choices. 
Lesson one from Mama. From the time I got my driver's license at 17 and for the next 40 some years, every time I left my mom, she would always say to me, drive careful. She of course meant it literally, but she was also, it was her way of saying, I care about you. I love you, I'm praying for you, and I know what's out there in the world, so choose your path carefully. Choosing to graft your branch to the true vine Jesus is the first step to a straight path, the right path, and in the big picture, the easiest path. Proverbs 3, 6 tells us, in all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. And in the very familiar 23rd Psalm, verse 3 says, he refreshes my soul, he guides me along the right paths. And Proverbs 23, 19 says, listen, my son, and be wise and set your hearts on the right path. So whether we're driving, walking, or just maneuvering through life, Mama and Jesus both say, drive careful and take the path that leads you to the true vine. Because there are other paths that we could take and other vines that we could graft to, but they will not help you produce good fruit. A path paved with selfishness leads to temporary pleasures. The paths of addiction, material wealth, isolation, rebellion, and all the other paths that lead you away from God result in separation from him, and they don't produce good fruit. We learn from the verses that we read in John that Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches. We also read that the vine is what gives life to those branches. The branches can't survive without the vine. And the true vine Jesus is our connection to God. Which brings us to lesson two from Mama, sending me to church. Branches need to stay grafted in the vine in order to live, grow, and bear fruit. One of the ways that Mama helped me graft my branch into that vine was to send me to church. From the time I was four or five years old, even when Mom couldn't go, she always made sure I got to church on, a, on Sundays. She would either send me with family friends or she would send me with my Uncle Junior. Um, she would either, can't talk about him either. <laughs> they would bring me up and they would bring me to this very church. Mom knew that here I would learn the importance of fellowship, prayer, and the Bible. Three things would, would keep my tiny little branch attached to the true vine. Mama knew the importance of fellowship, and Jesus addressed it in Matthew 18, 19, and 20, where he said, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. And in Hebrews, it encourages fellowship in verses 25 and 26. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. Yeah. Through fellowship, we, are not only, we not only connect to the Lord, but we connect to others. We experience the power that is the name of Jesus. We learn from others' experiences and through their wisdom, we're able, to, we're able to connect to one another and encourage one another. We experience love in so many levels and we're able to partner with each other in ministries. Mama knew the power of prayer and throughout the Bible, we're taught the importance of prayer and that is one of the most powerful connections that we can have with the Lord. Because prayer changes things. Prayer brings salvation. Prayer brings healing. And prayer brings wisdom. James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, we get, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Matthew 26 tells us, prayer brings us back from the edge when we're tempted. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And prayer provides protection. I've probably talked about this before, but it's a story that's worth repeating. 
there was a night when my mom was woken up in the middle of the night and she just felt this urge to pray for my dad. It was when he was driving truck and he was out of town. She began to pray. She had no idea what was going on or what was wrong, but she just began to pray. And at that very moment, she found out later, my dad was being held up at gunpoint in New York City. They held a gun to him and they took his wallet and they ripped off gold chain off his neck, but they didn't get him because mama listened and mama was praying. She was praying for her, her, his protection and Jesus was listening because the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust him. Mama knew the value of connecting to God through the word. Second Timothy tells us, and it's a great reminder, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. The Bible is the sap that runs through the vine and into the branches and gives life to the fruit. Lesson number three from mama. Now focus. My mom actually had a list of things that she would say to me whenever I headed out to do something. Right after she told me to drive careful, she would say to me, now focus, because apparently my mind tends to wander and race ahead to the next 12 or 13 things that I have to do. And, um, which, and it prevents me sometimes from giving my full attention to whatever it is I'm doing at the moment. And I'm not sure when she figured this out, but it might have been the time when I was getting ready to run errands and I had like five places to go and my mind again was racing and it was cold outside. So I, I wanted to put on a couple of layers. So I put on a hoodie and I put on my purple jacket and I, I get ready and I start heading out the door and my mom looks at me and she says, are you really going out like that? And I'm like, what? And she points and I'm like, oh. I had in my, absent-mindedness, I had zipped the right side of my black hoodie to the left side of my purple coat, and I zipped it up. I looked like the court jester with the two blocks of, of, of color. Now, maybe it was because we all last, I would probably, Lynn knows, we kind of lost track of how many times I've walked into glass doors without seeing them. <laughs> um, or maybe it was the day that I almost broke my nose looking into a um, ice cream cooler because I didn't see the door. So, so yeah, I might have an issue with keeping in the moment and concentrating on the task at hand. But the worst thing that could have happened to me with those things was a little bit of embarrassment, um, a black eye, which I did get one time, Linda, and, or a broken nose, which I did almost get. But in 1 Peter 5.8, Jesus warns us about what can happen if we don't stay focused on him. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And he'll use his tricks. He'll use distractions, like a microphone that doesn't want to stay on my tiny little ear. He'll use evil, and he'll use deceit. He'll use lies, and beware. He's so aware. He will use false teachers who are producing bad fruit. Lesson number four, spend time with me. During the last couple of years that my mom was with us, we tried to do as much as we could for her that she couldn't do anymore. We would do her shopping and her errands. We'd take her to an, her appointments, um, do all those things for her. And, and she, as much as she appreciated it, and she really, really did, what she wanted most was for us to spend time with her. Just talking or sharing a meal, maybe playing some games or watching TV, anything, just as long as we were there with her. Jesus wants the same thing. 
He wants us to be there with him. He wants us to spend time with him in prayer. First, Thessalon First Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. I know that sounds like a whole lot of praying. How do you think I feel? I'm the one with the focus issue. But seriously, the more we talk to God throughout the day, the more connected we are with him. The more we invite him to be a part of our everyday decisions, the more that we look to him for guidance, the more chances we find to thank him, the more time we spend interceding for others, the more time we spend praying in the spirit, the more time we spend speaking the word over our lives and over the lives of the ones we love, before long, without even realizing it, we will find that our hearts and our minds are continually praying. The other way that God wants us to spend time is in the word. We're directed in Deuteronomy 11. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Praying and reading the Bible are actions that we need to take to stay connected to God. But in the end, the rewards are priceless. Back to John 15. Not only does he tell us that he is the vine and we are the branches, but he also tells us that God is the gardener. One of the many things that a gardener does is pruning. He cuts off the branches that don't bear fruit, and he prunes the ones that do bear fruit, so they'll bear even more fruit. What does God prune from our lives to help us produce more fruit? How about the unnecessary habits that we have? All the extra fluff in our lives that has no purpose. Unwholesome activities. Unprofitable ambitions. And unhealthy relationships. Which brings me to Mama's lesson number five. You are known by the company that you keep. Mama was always worried about what kind of friends I chose. She was always worried there might be bad apples, bad fruit influencing me. She would remind me that you are known by the company that you keep. I remember this even to this day. Very recently at work, I kept being assigned to a position where I was with these two particular women almost every day. Don't get me wrong, they were very hard workers, but one was a bit of an instigator, a quiet instigator, which are the worst, and she would like to rile her friend up. And her friend fed off everything she did. And her friend was very loud, a little bit of a troublemaker, and her language was very, very rough. And it started to bother me because I started to worry that other people, especially my managers, were going to see me with these girls every day, and they were going to hear them, and they were going to just kind of lump me in with them. And it was going to make me look like I was one of them, and like I was that I acted like them, and I didn't want that to happen. So I began to pray for them as well as pray about the situation. And it wasn't but a few days, and one of the managers came to me and said, Renee, would you be interested in, in uh, training for a new position? I was, sure. So this past week, I trained for a new position, and um, I am now in a completely different part of the building than these other two girls. <laughs> So God was moving, he was pruning by moving me um, away from an unhealthy situation so that I could continue to make good fruit. But God can only prune us if we let him. We have free will. We can choose Jesus or we can reject him. Um, John 15, 6 warns us about the consequences of rejecting him. The gardener will, gardener will cut us off from the vine and we will be thrown away into the fire and burned. How much more literal can that be? But if we choose a Christ-led life and we allow the gardener to prune away the things that prevent us from producing good fruit, before we know it, our branches are going to be so full, they're going to be dragging on the ground. I'd like to introduce another character to our little orchard here that we're talking about. And that's the Holy Spirit. 
And I think of him as the pollinator, the bee. I know you're all waiting for that. <laughs> He's the wingman. Um, the bee is the one who goes from branch to branch, blossom to blossom, and he deposits that precious pollen that allows that fruit to form. Just like the Holy Spirit goes from branch to branch with little nuggets of wisdom, little drops of conviction, he shines a light for us to show us what are good choices, what are bad choices. He throws up a stop sign, sometimes a detour in our path when it's needed. Those are called divine delays. I want you to remember that, learn to recognize them because you never know when a wrong turn could be a chance meeting with someone that you really need to meet. You never know when a long red light is saving you from danger that's ahead. You never know when a traffic jam could really just be putting you in the right place at the right time for a blessing. Or a lost set of keys could be saving you from an accident. The Holy Spirit also empowers us with a boldness to act on things that we might not otherwise think of or do. Yeah. And he nudges our hearts. As Pastor mentioned earlier, right now the church has $23,000 in the, pave, in the um, parking lot paving fund because God has been nudging hearts. We are getting money from places and people that don't even know what we're doing. But it's happening because God is nudging their hearts. The Holy Spirit also sprinkles us with knowledge about things like morals and good work ethics. Lesson number six for Mama. If something is worth doing, it's worth doing right. That was one of my mom's favorite quotes. Paul puts it this way. In Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart and work as working for the Lord, not for your human masters. And how do we do this? We do this by develop, developing the fruits of discipline, self-control, and willpower. So what about our fruit? What kind of fruit do we try to produce on our own? We treasure material things and money above all else. We dabble in things that are not of God, like witchcraft and sorcery. We grow things that are the opposite of the fruits of the spirit. We do things like hate, bitterness, strife, rage, jealousy, selfish, selfish ambition. And some even use drugs or alcohol to fill a void. You're known by the, pr the, the fruit that you produce. Healthy fruit shows that the tree is healthy. What does your fruit look like? Is your fruit bitter or is it sour? Is it maybe full of pits more than flesh or is it dried up like raisins? Will it leave a bad taste in God's mouth? Will he spit you out? Or is it sweet? Good fruit is being an effective witness for Christ. Good fruits are labors of love. Good fruits are the fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Lesson number seven, would you take Jesus there with you? More choices. Abiding in Jesus is an active choice, not a passive one. It is actions and choices every day on your part that keep the relationship growing and keep you producing good fruit. When I was growing up and I would ask my mom if I could go someplace, she would always say to me, you can go as long as it's someplace you would take Jesus. I guess as a kid, I didn't realize that regardless of my answer or my decision, good or bad, that he was coming with me anyway. Because whether we want to admit it or not, or think about it, he's everywhere with us. Think about the last 48 hours as you, as you let that sink in, about what's happening what's been happening in the last 48 hours in your life and realizing he was there every moment. 
Whether or not we realize it, it's a very good thing that he's always there. Why should we want or even need him there? First, we need guidance with the good choices. Deuteronomy 6.18 says, Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so that it may go well with you. Good fruit. Next, we need his help to make, keep us from making bad choices. Bad fruit. We need him there because having someone with you at all times that you know you can trust to protect you is invaluable. Psalms 91.1 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Good fruit. And we need him to help us overcome temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Good fruit. Another way that we can produce good fruit is obedience and trust in God. Lesson eight, because I said so. Growing up, if you ever question an order from my mom, her answer was simply, because I said so, which was accompanied by the look, and then we would simply do what we were told. Jesus, on the other hand, took a moment to explain what, why we should obey him and what the consequences would be if we didn't. In Luke 6, 49, he said, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Yeah. Then a few chapters later, he softened his message a little bit with the reward that we would get for obedience. And that would be blessings. In Luke 11, he replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. But for our rebellious nature, we would learn so much quicker that obedience in, in, to God is what's best for our own good, as well as how much it glorifies God. Another form of obedience that we sometimes struggle with is tithing and giving. Good fruit. Yeah. Mama taught me from the beginning about the importance of tithing. And God shows me every day the importance of it. Luke 6, 38 says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap for the measure you use is the measure, is what will be measured to you. Amen. One of the many stories that I could tell you about tithing um, happened. It started right here at church one day. Brian and I were just leaving and uh, we got in the car and he said, oh, you know what? He said, I noticed this week your car needs tires really bad. And he said, I stopped after work one day and I've got a price. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was somewhere around like $423, he told me. And this was a while ago. And so I don't even remember if I was working or not at the time, but I definitely knew that we couldn't afford $423 for a set of tires. And I told him, I, I don't even think we, I can even see in the near future where we can do that. And we got home and I remembered that I hadn't checked the mail on Saturday. So I ran out to the mailbox and I got the mail and there was a check in the mail and it was from an insurance company. We had recently changed insurance companies and we didn't realize, but we were getting a refund from the old company. Opens a checkup, guess how much it was? Real close, it was within two or three dollars more than wow. what we needed in order to buy the tires. <laughs> Um, and that's just one of so, so many stories um, that I could tell you that where God has just blessed us so much um, with giving, you know, always more, always more. Um, you know, and what was funny about that is that check, you have to think about this, that check was written before Brian even looked at those tires, before Brian even knew we needed tires. It was written 
before Brian stopped to get that. So God knew beforehand exactly what we were going to need. Second yeah. Corinthians 9, 6 says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. This is just one of the many times, like I said, that God's provided, um, no matter how bleak our finances looked or how we th what we thought, God had other plans. I once heard someone say, I can't afford to tithe. And all I could think of was, with everything that God has done for me, I can't afford not to. Come on. He will outbless you every single time. Yeah. And Mama's final lesson, lesson 11, be still. And I thank you guys and the worship team for singing that song today because it just meant so much to me. Um, how can we hear if we're not listening to God? How can we obey if we're not listening to God, if we're not being still and listening? Oh, but Lord, what about my awful boss? What about COVID? What about those girls at work? What should I do? The Lord shall fight for you. You need only be still. Exodus 14, 14. But Lord, what about the election? What about politics? What should I do? Shh. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 46.10, which was my mama's favorite verse. I'm going to wrap this up with a few questions for you to think about. Number one, have you chosen to take the path that leads to Jesus, the true vine? Number two, if so, are you doing everything you can to remain and grow in your relationship with him? Number three, will you allow God to help you cut away the things in your life that are not allowing you to be the best you? Number four, can you allow yourself to be guided by the Holy Spirit to greater things? Number five, how's your fruit looking? Healthy or not so much? Number six, do you trust God enough to be obedient to him not only for your own good, but to glorify him. Today, I hope that you've taken something away from Mama's lessons. And I have one more lesson for you, but this one is from me on this Mother's Day. When Mama tells you something, listen and learn to read between the lines because she's probably telling you a whole lot more than you realize. In closing, I'd like to share one more thing from my mama. I was recently looking through a scrapbook. Um, I was looking for some pictures for my brother's retirement, and I came across this note that my mom wrote me probably in the late 70s. And it says, take the glass off, no matter what anyone says, you being a Christian have a secret weapon, the promises of God. She quotes Psalm 55, 22, which is cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Yeah. And she quotes Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. She goes on to say, you have to keep your heart and mind open for the Lord's will. But pray for guidance in what you want, for he has said that no good thing will be, held, will be withheld from those that walk uprightly. He says that through faith, your prayers will be answered according to the will of the Father, which is in heaven. Thank you.